Hello, everybody, and good evening. Welcome to the Eugene Public Life Library's Windfall Reading Series. My name is Wendy Beck. I work at the Eugene Public Library, and I'm very glad to have you all here to listen to another evening of poetry. You may be expecting to see Matias Torres, who's been a wonderful host these past few seasons. Um, he has moved back to his beloved hometown and state in Arizona to take a job there and be closer to family. So now you get me. I'm very excited to be here. I'm very glad to um, be part of this event, and I'm very glad that you're here as well. Um, in addition to thanking you all for coming, I wanted to thank you also. I wanted to thank our sponsors, of course, the Lane Literary Guild and the Friends of the Eugene Public Library. Without both, this would not be happening. So thank you so much. Um, at the conclusion of the reading, we will have a question and answer for our two poets. You can get questions to me a couple of different ways. Uh, one way to do so is to uh, write your, your questions and your comments in the YouTube comments uh, section right below the screen here, right below. Uh, if you don't feel like doing that, you are more than welcome to email me. My email will be posted by my colleague in the YouTube's comments. So please do feel free to email me. I'll be checking throughout the evening. And if there are any questions that we can um, answer for you or comments, I or Henry Alley will be reading them. So those are the two ways to um, get some questions and comments for our poets. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Henry Alley, who's in charge of the Lane Literary Guild. And let me get him on the screen here. Thanks very, very much, Wendy, and we really appreciate your leadership in this. And again, it's a privilege for me to be a moderator here for our third uh, windfall reading this season. And we are very happy to continue a tradition which comes under the umbrella of the Lane Literary Guild. The Lane Literary Guild has been around since 1984, and it has been strengthening, I think, our literary network uh, here for a, number, for a number of years in a variety of ways. And one of the ways is to have this Windfall series. The Windfall series of readings uh, takes uh, usually two people. And uh, it actually has been going on since 1995, I would say. So we have quite a tradition growing and uh, we've had two pairs of wonderful readers so far since September. Uh, tonight, we are graced with two great prose writers. Um, and I'm going to introduce first uh, Shirley Perez West, and then I will be introducing Austin Gray. So tonight, uh, Shirley, her poetry has been published in Sheltering an anthology of Northwest poets writing during the pandemic, and her novel, El Sueno, an atmospheric rendering of the American takeover of California, is being considered for publication. She has been a reporter for the Associated Press, the Eugene Register Guard, and a contract features writer for print and online publications. And I have to say that Shirley and I were in the same fiction critique group for a number of years which grew out of our workshop experience at Centrum Foundation up in Port Townsend. And it was always a privilege to hear her read and to, to consider her, her fiction writing. I actually still remember the vividness of the landscape that she presented to us and the, and the striking sense of uh, a young point of view uh, embracing Mexico and being a part of a larger world. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Shirley Perez West. Thank you, Henry and Wendy. Uh, thanks so much, Henry, for inviting me. This is great to have this opportunity to read from my work. As uh, you both mentioned, I'm gonna be reading from my novel entitled El Sueño, which means the dream. It's historical. And apart from being historical, it's also a coming of age story uh, about a young woman who actually comes to maturity during a pivotal year in California's history when it um, changes over from uh, Mexico to the United States. Uh, it's a time when the forces of manifest destiny were sweeping west. So without further introduction, I'm gonna get right to it. 
El Sueño. This is uh, chapter one. October 1845, the San Francisco Peninsula, Alta, California. Mariana Avila edged around the darkened Vaquero's barracks, her horse in tow, careful not to disturb a pair of sleeping dogs. One raised its head and sniffed the air. She held her breath until he settled his chin back onto the dirt. Maybe they'd follow, maybe not. No matter, as long as they didn't bark and wake the whole rancho. The night air was sour with the scent of fermenting apples as she wound through the orchard, searching for a stump to boost herself. Her horse, Armanito, wore only a blanket, bit, and halter. It couldn't be helped. Her saddle was locked in a storeroom with the better tack. When she found a suitable old log, she stepped up, grabbed a handful of Armanito's braided mane, and swung onto his back. At the lane, she turned to face the hacienda. Only the second floor of the casa was visible above the courtyard's whitewashed walls. The shuttered windows, like closed eyes, would be thrown open in an hour. And in another hour, her stepmother and stepsisters would come from their devotions in the family chapel. And one of the girls would be sent to fetch Mariana from her room. She felt a twinge of guilt that she would cause her sister's distress, but her stepmother needed to be taught a lesson. The moon cast blue light on the worn path leading south and west toward the old adobe at the edge of her father's rancho. It was the place she and her brother were born. She kept Armanito at a canter until the trail began its climb through ancient redwoods their bark as shaggy as his winter coat, their shadows stealing the moonlight. After a while, she slowed him again, worried she might miss the wall of tangled roots that marked the skyline trail. From there, it would be 15, maybe 20 minutes over the ridge and down a draw to the old adobe. It could take at least half a day for her father's vaqueros to find her, too late for the family to travel up the peninsula to the mission San Francisco de Asís and the families living near there, Ramón de Jaro's family in particular. A month earlier, at a gathering that included the de Jaro family, her stepmother announced that Mariana had recently celebrated her 18th birthday. Along with the many congratulations and well wishes, Mariana caught the sly looks and whispered judgments. 18 and still unmarried. They plodded on, Mariana watching for the trail marker, straining to see through a fine mist blowing in. Soon, the mist thickened and eddied around Armanito's hooves until it swallowed the ground. The fog rose, blurring the outlines of the trees. She pulled right just in time to miss a low branch, then left when a giant trunk loomed up through the whiteness. Armanito moaned. We're fine. She patted his neck and tried to quiet her breathing as she led him on each step a prayer that, that they weren't lost. She thought of dismounting and walking ahead of her horse to scout for clear spots or deer trails, but in truth, it was more dangerous to be on foot. What if she were to come across an animal or God help her, one of the wild men said to camp in the deep woods of the Sierra Morena. The damp seeped through her serape and jacket down to the linen blouse that once belonged to her brother. Everything she wore was once Joaquin's except her boots and her felt sombrero molded to fit her head at a gallop. The shivering started at her chin and rattled down her spine. It wasn't the cold. Armanito moaned again and stopped to paw the ground. Her old nurse, Conde, if she were here, would tell Mariana to take a deep breath. She sucked in wet air, let it out through pursed lips, another in and out, and again until the shaking calmed. She looked up into the shrouded canopy but saw no sign of sky. She guessed she had been riding for an hour. They moved on, the eerie quiet relieved only by Armanito's soft snorts and her own heartbeat thrumming in her ears. 
she blinked against the cold and to relieve the strain of not seeing more than a foot beyond Artemanito's nose, she couldn't tell anymore if they were still climbing. Maybe she should stop and wait for the fog to clear or the dawn to reach into the forest. But she had already made her choice and it was best to keep moving. Joaquin would say she was stubborn or worse. She wondered what he would do, but he would not have to sneak out in the pre-dawn darkness. Little by little, the thick gauze of fog thinned, the outlines of trees sharpened, the fog began settling like a dust cloud, then suddenly, hurriedly, it pulled back. They were traversing a hillside of pines and scrub oaks, the dawn lightening the eastern sky. She turned on Manito and urged him uphill, fast as she dared, then stopped at the crest to scan each direction. To the south, she glimpsed the sparkling trickle of San Francisquito Creek. They were well outside the rancho's borders and at least an hour from the old adobe. She pushed through a thicket that scraped against her legs, grateful she was wearing pants, and eased Armanito down the creek's embankment. Sorry, she said and patted his neck. His hooves splashed through the shallow water, interrupting the reflection of sky. Most of the rancho would be up by now, and soon enough everyone would know she was gone. Her father would send his vaqueros to neighboring ranchos, maybe even to the San Jose Pueblo. It struck Mariana that the lost work time would inflame her father's anger. In truth, she hadn't allowed herself to brood over the trouble she would cause and the scandal. She'd be branded a disobedient daughter, a shameless girl, a wild calf as her stepmother once called her. Better than a tame cow, she said to her horse and better that she make it clear to everyone that she would choose her own future. Armanito's head jerked up, his ears shifting for sounds. What? As soon as she spoke, she heard a hollow thud like a giant log falling behind them. Apurate! She bent low and held tight as Armanito lurched up the opposite bank. She pulled him toward the trail that ran along the creek, urged him on, no matter that the blanket shifted every time his hooves hit the ground. The rushing air thrilled her, but she could barely hold on. Surely the bear, if that's what it was, had given up the chase by now. She tugged the reins, then released them when she saw the downed log. Artemanito's breaths came deep and fast. She tucked and tightened against him for the jump. Two more, one more step, and up. She rose with her horse, holding through one heartbeat and then she was loose with a blanket flying back until the ground shot up to catch her. Mariana lifted her chin off the ground and a burst of fire shot up her chest. She dropped back down and turned her head, blinking hard to clear dirt from her eyelashes. Where was her horse? She could hear the low chuff of his breaths, the scratch of small uneasy steps. She tried again, pushing up with her palms, but the sudden stab below her breast took her breath away. She eased herself down and tried to slow her breathing. The ground was damp, thick with moss and brittle leaves. She slid a hand under her cheek, wiped tears with a finger. A tremor of fear shook her. The bear could still be nearby. She had to get back on her horse. She thought of the day she'd caught the attention of a bull. She and Joaquin had been practicing roping calves that had roamed into an open field. Hold still, her brother whispered while he lifted the riata, his riata. It took all of her will to stay where she stood, the bawling calf she had tied kicking at her ankles. The bull lowered its head. One of them would die, she thought to herself. And then, pounding hooves, whistling, yelling, she gritted her teeth, a terrible hum vibrating in her head. And then, whomp, the bull dropped, skidded to a stop, not one horse length away from her. Three vaqueros circled the downed animal, two pulling their riatas. Joaquin, on his gray, came at her fast, grabbed her arm, and pulled her onto the back of his horse. Later, her old nurse, Conde, would tend to her bruised arm. Joaquin would be scolded for not paying better attention to his surroundings. The vaqueros would sit around the fire and add details to the story of their feet, and Mariana's father would lift his chin 
and gently nod his approval for her bravery, no one but Conde would know that she had wet herself. Sounds of life sifted into the forest with the filtered light, the patter of dripping leaves, the crackle of small animals scuttling through the brush, the far off hoot of a morning dove. She slid a hand under her breast and felt a knob the size of a quail's egg. She remembered a vaquero who had come to Conde, his torso bruised and bloodied from a steer's horn. His ribs were broken, Conde told him, and he would need to wear a tight girdle. He too had a swelling beneath his breast. She pulled at one end of her serape, dragging it slowly under her body through the dirt. If she could roll onto her side, bring the ends together, tie them, cinch them, maybe she could get to her horse. <clears throat> Patrick Murphy halted his wagon atop a rise and looked back at the lower reaches of the San Francisco Bay. A cloud of honking geese lifted from the distant marches, marshes and gathered into a dark mass, nearly blotting out the gray dawn. Jesus, Patrick said at the wonder of it. For the past hour, he'd followed the San Francisco Creek as it meandered through oak-studded grasslands. He worked out he was at least halfway to the logging camp at Peralta's Redwoods, but he had a climb ahead of him and a narrow trail not meant for a wagon. The tail of the flock cleared the marshlands, exposing the silhouette of bald hills east of the bay and beyond them the Sierra. October and already snow crowned the great peaks. Since he and his uncles stumbled into California last spring, Patrick could count only a handful of days when the sun hadn't prevailed. It suited him. Ahead, the trail veered northwest before disappearing into a retreating fog bank. It would be slow going with the climb, even if there wasn't much of a load in the wagon. A sack of meal, another of beans, a butt of fat back, and a hat full of coffee. He'd probably have done fine with a mule if not for the long two-handled saw Sutter sent back down the bay with a launch. The first of the sun's rays cast a quiet light on the high grasses, like home, like Ireland. He scuttled down the creek bank, dipped a leather canteen at a clear spot, daydreaming about how far he'd come. He'd have his own piece of this paradise, he would. When he hoisted himself back into the wagon, the mayor shuffled nervously. He scanned the banks and distant woods for something afoot. The mares tugged against their lead. Settle now, he warned, taking up the reins. He drove them another 50 yards until they balked. He set the brake and jumped down, cooing at them as he glanced around. What is it? He asked the mares, and then he saw for himself. Up ahead, a horse shifted and snorted near a downed tree. Farther on, a boy lay face down, his sombrero cocked to one side. Patrick looked to either side of the trail and up the creek for signs of anyone else about. He stepped around the mares, sifting through the scant Spanish he'd picked up in the past six months. Puedo ayudar, he called. The boy, a wisp of a creature, struggled to pull himself along. Patrick looked about again for someone else, perhaps lying in wait, then ventured closer. The boy rolled onto his side with a shriek, crushing his hat beneath him. A length of black braid fell across his neck. I'll be damned, Patrick said under his breath. He couldn't be sure, but the girl looked familiar. Not a month ago, he'd passed her on the road to the Rancho Cañada del Sueño. She rode at the head of a party of Californios, finely dressed women in ox-driven carts, men on adorned horses. He and his uncles had stopped a while to speak with the patron, Senor Avila, about purchasing land in the neighborhood. Her father? She glanced his way, then beyond him. There's naught but myself. He squatted on his heels, tapped at his chest. Solo yo. He pivoted in the direction of his outfit, then back, extending an arm. I have a wagon. She eyed him straight on, seeming to take his measure. Jesus, what the hell was she doing here dressed as she was and on her own? 
He wondered if someone had gone for help and would be coming back for her. Solo too, he asked, pointing at her. Mi caballo, she spoke without looking at him, an order. Donna Vila's daughter, sure enough. He looked to the Arabian still standing by the tree, likely spooked. And if I brought him to you, then what? Patrick stood, stepped closer. She struggled to right herself, wincing with the effort. One of her trouser legs was torn, and beneath it, blood oozed from a gash along her shin. He couldn't tell if her leg was broken, but even if it was, it wouldn't keep her on the ground. The fine wool serape she wore was twisted and torn and seemed to bind her. He reached to pull it loose. Her eyes flashed, a dark glare. No me toques. He drew back and crossed his arms. He didn't have enough Spanish to ask after her injuries, but clearly she was badly hurt. Is someone coming for you? Color faded from her face, but for a purplish swelling at her cheekbone. She angled her head toward the horse and sucked in her breath. Armanito! The horse whinnied, shuffling near the tree root as if caught. I don't know what you're doing out here on your own, but I have a good idea where you're from. She cut her eyes at him, her mouth tight. He waited a moment for a word, then walked toward the horse. As he neared, the Arabian's ears drew back. You've had a time, haven't you? He stopped a short length away and looked to see if the horse was hobbled. The horse's lip curled up as if tasting the air, but his ears came forward. Patrick stepped closer, cooed low in his throat, then ventured a hand to the horse's muzzle. Had yourself a scare. He eased the bit from the horse's mouth and scratched the smooth patch between his eyes as the animal dropped its head. He ran a hand along each shoulder, then down each leg, feeling for injury, but found nothing amiss. He led the horse toward the wagon, but the mares jostled and whined, so he picketed him in a stand of trees. He found the horse's blanket on the damp ground, made a space for it in the wagon, then went back for the girl. She lay perched on her side, trembling, her arms crossed over her middle as if to hold herself still. He came behind her. I need to get you into the wagon. No, no, no. She leaned forward as if to crawl away, then caught herself with a gasp. Look here. There's no chance you can ride. None. He looked down at her face, smudged with dirt, a tear dripped across her nose. I can't just leave you. He got his feet under him and bent deep in his knees. You can fight this, but it won't serve either of us. Dios mio, she squeezed her eyes tight as soon as he touched her. When he lifted her, she gasped, but did not cry out. He stepped forward, unsteady, though she couldn't have weighed more than a full sack of meal. Her hair smelled of pine sap. He felt his chin whiskers brush her forehead and the warm puffs of her breath against his neck. When he lowered her onto the wagon bed, she hugged herself and did not speak or look at him. He tugged the blanket until she was well centered, then tucked the sacks of flour and beans against her to fight the pitching and rocking that was to come. He hummed an old ballad to ease the quiet, glancing at her now and again, though she lay still as stone with her eyes shut tight. He checked the gash on her shin, the blood dried. Fine then, he guessed it would take an hour, maybe more, to get her home. Sunlight slanted through the trees, glinting off the awkward two-handled saw as he cut through a log that blocked the trail. When he'd finished and was fixing the saw against the sideboard, he noticed her shivering. He shook out his heavy canvas coat and covered her. She flinched as he tucked the coat between her and the sacks meant to hold her steady. I'll make no excuse for the smell, but it should do till you're home. No, she lifted her head then dropped with, with a wince. Por favor, hay una casita. Her voice trailed and she looked away. From what he'd seen of the girl's home, it was no casita and her father? He'd been cordial enough to Patrick and his uncles, helpful even, suggesting they speak with a neighbor about land. He'd asked how they'd come into the country and the neighborhood and seemed satisfied with their answers, 
and then he left them to rejoin his family. It made no sense that Senor Avila's daughter would be traveling alone and bareback at that. I haven't the faintest notion what you're about, but sure as I stand, he blew out a breath. I know your doll will have my hide or worse if he finds us roaming these hills. He hoisted himself onto the seat. I'm taking you home. No tienes derecho, she said with some force. You have no right. He waited for her to say more, something he could understand, but it seemed she'd said her piece. He clucked his tongue and the wagon lurched forward. Mi caballo, he's picketed. No, 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 es muy peligroso. He let the wagon roll another few yards, then stopped and set the brake. She was right. The horse couldn't stay tethered like bear bait. As long as he doesn't trouble the mares, he jumped down to let the horse loose. <clears throat> Patrick drove into the foothills, halting here and again to clear fallen branches. Once when they stopped, the girl called for her horse and he came into view, but kept his distance. Later, Patrick glanced back to see how she was faring. She had the gray pallor of someone in distress and her mouth was drawn tight. So he started idly speaking to keep her mind off the pain. He said how he knew where she came from and what he and his uncles were about, leaving out the pitiable fact that he had no part in what they were building. He called out if he saw something that seemed worth note, his awe at the giant trees, a glimpse of some animal scuttling by. He hadn't a clue how much English she understood. Sometimes he tossed out a Spanish word or two. She made no response to any of it. When he grew tired of talking, he hummed a few songs he'd known since he was a lad, songs that offered comfort. They crested a rise and he spied the tidy rows of orchard trees marching toward the grand hacienda of the Rancho Cañada del Sueño. He stopped the wagon. We're about there. The spread was something to behold, a two-story whitewashed hacienda with a timbered roof and broad veranda. Several smaller buildings sat inside and outside a long sweep of wall. The whole of it nestled between the densely forested Sierra Moreno to the west and rolling hills to the east. A rider trotted through the open gate. Just then, the girl's horse came up at a run, heading toward the barn. There's someone come to greet us, he spoke over his shoulder. The rider dismounted and walked his horse closer, an Indian by the look of him, tall, barefoot, no hat to shade his tan-lined face. Buenos dias, senor, me llamo Tomas. Colin Patrick Murphy, he noted the long knife sheathed against Tomas's chaps. Aquí, Tomas, the girl called weakly. Tomas stepped up. Que pasó, chaparita? He took her hand and glanced about the wagon. Patrick cut in. I found here near the San Francisco, you know it, where it turns down to the valley. Tomas glanced at him but gave no sign he understood. Mi padre, donde esta? The girl lifted her head, winced. Galmate. Tomas patted her hand, then looked to Patrick. Esta solo? Patrick nodded, wishing in fact that he wasn't alone. If his uncles were here with him, the Patron, well, he might remember when a lot of them came through and understand that they were practically neighbors. Tomas mounted his horse and jerked his head toward the Hacienda's gate. Come, he said. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shirley, for such a vivid reading and uh, actually immersing us in that, that particular historic time frame. And uh, so t tonight we're going to also have a, another prose writer, and that is Austin Gray. And he is going to be reading uh, his creative nonfiction. And we are very privileged to have him here. And he, his work has appeared in Gertrude, Floating Bridge Review, Envoy, and Willamette Week. 
his chapbook um, poems, uh, The Mystery of Horses, was co-winner of the 2010 Robin, Robin Becker Prize. He earned an MFA at the University of Montana studying under Richard Hugo. And I want to just say, you know, uh, as his husband, <laughs> I have a particular admiration for uh, his poetry as well as his nonfiction. And I, I'm struck, you know, by images like um, Aspen Shimmer in his poem, uh, the Mystery of Horses, uh, the title po poem, and also Cumulus Ships in his, his poem, Clouds. So um, both he and Shirley have such striking visual uh, powers. So without further ado, I will introduce Austin Gray. Thank you, Hank. Very sweet. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate being able to read with Shirley. What a vivid piece. This is about the fourth, fourth or fifth chapter in a much longer piece. And all you really need to know is that the narrator was raised on the East Coast. Uh, his mother was a botany professor. His father was an engineer, kind of an executive engineer. And he has a brother. And he has been sent to live in Montana with his mother's sister, his aunt, and her husband. And the reasons for that become clear in this piece. Morning, Sun Mountain Ranch, Montana, September 1958. Flowers from home don't grow here. Summer comes late and fall too soon at my aunt and uncle's dude ranch. First freeze last night and snow skiffs on the Little Belt Mountains that rise above us. At home in Connecticut, we could still be swimming at Todd's Point on Long Island Sound. When my brother stayed here at the ranch all those summers before, I was mad to come, but now I want to go home. I sit after breakfast at the kitchen table and stare at the mountains. Across the ranch yard, my cousin, my uncle's sister's son, herds the straying milk cows into the barn. Worse strays too, he says. My aunt clatters dishes into the sink, says, a mile above sea level, we sure get the seasons, don't you think, Maddie? My uncle finishes drying, snaps the towel and pours himself more coffee from the copper pot. He says, your aunt said something to you, you should answer, don't mope. He sits down across from me and watches me count my big tan lined pads and my Ticonderoga pencils, my new blue Parker jotter, and my Windsor and Newton paint box, dad sent for sixth grade that starts tomorrow. Only about 289 people live in the nearest town, Nyhart, and some of those just part time. So it's almost a ghost town. At home in Connecticut, we could go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art just about any time in Manhattan or the Museum of Natural History. Here, you have to drive 60 miles to find a Safeway. Nothing in Nyhart but abandoned mines, collapsed adits, broken mills, slag heaps. Our log school, four grades in a room, gets flooded by Belt Creek in the spring, and everybody seems really poor. I say, I'm not moping, just thinking about school. Well, you could be a little more sociable. My uncle usually heads out with my cousin right after breakfast, but today he sits with me, smoking one of his lucky strikes, which I'd like to try, and blowing smoke, which I hate. He's wearing his blue work shirt and jeans, his work cowboy boots. He's trying to make friends, but I won't look up. He's really almost about 60 years old. Looking forward to school, Maddie? No more hay baling this year, huh? Your favorite. <laughs> I had to ride the baler twine box round and round the dusty alfalfa fields, checking the knots. I ask, is everybody really poor in Nyhart? What with the mines all closed and there's really nothing except the highway jobs and the tourists? What? No, don't be silly. A lot of folks haven't had a fair shake, but some don't understand the mines won't come back. This gossip about a molybdenum strike's a joke. Maddie, you can't live in fantasy. Gotta move on. And don't be thinking you're better than they are. We aren't rich up here. But that's not true. 
I know for a fact my uncle gets money every month from a trust fund. Our knives and forks are sterling silver from his grandmother. His family ran cotton mills whaling earlier in Massachusetts. My cousin told me, money in Harvard, but your uncle acts like Gabby Hayes. Ha, what a joke. My uncle says my cousin was a juvenile delinquent in Providence, Rhode Island, and his mother drinks too much, so he got sent here to shape up. My cousin sneaks cigarettes. My aunt at the sink says, don't look down your nose, Maddie, just because we're a little better off. My aunt's wearing her usual plaid cowboy cut flannel shirt and jeans. I've never seen her wear a real dress and nylons. I could wear her shoes if my feet weren't so small. They're boy shoes like my Buster Brown's. Only she uses leather for laces. She says you can pull it tight enough and they won't snap. I say, Letty Halverson's in my Sunday school class and she's all bossy about the mines and her dad getting rich from claims. So what about stupid dreams? Don't fall for that like some dumb dudes. We don't fall for that, do we, Maddie? My uncle screws up his face to look doofus and snorts and blows out smoke. I laugh, but I hate it when I like my uncle. He might think I want to stay here, not go back home east. I don't do it on purpose, but I start sneezing. I keep getting one cold after another. Oh, for Christ's sake, stop that. I can't help it. Smoke makes me sneeze. My dad had to stop smoking because of his heart attack and maybe dying. My uncle jerks back in his chair, stands, jams his lucky into the ashtray and snorts again. When he's disgusted, you better watch out. I flinch, but try not to show. He says, I just get to thinking you're interested in something here. My aunt jumps in. Maddie, finish with your school stuff. Don't dawdle and mope. Busy is better. Finish your chores. I stacked all the pine we split yesterday. They keep watching me. They never ask if I'm sad about my mom being sick, but keep trying to make friends, but I just can't. From all my visits to strangers' houses, when mom and dad have been sick over the past few years, I've learned you better not make friends because you just have to leave. My uncle takes a deep breath, smiles, says, if you don't know what to do, I got plenty of chores down the machine shop. Help me grease the IH tractor? Like that's a treat? I don't answer and my uncle stomps out and the dogs follow him down to where the tractors and stuff are stored for the season. My aunt stops rubbing lotion into her hands, stands absolutely still watching me, then points out the window over the sink north toward the haystack lots and where the sarvisberry bushes have gone red. She can stand still as a great blue heron, but stab as fast as they do to slap your hand. I smell the sweet almond or the lotion. My mom wears different kinds of perfume, but my aunt never does. The only thing I ever smell on her is the Jergens, but she never gets that close to me, so I could be wrong. My uncle keeps trying to hug me, but he smells of Lucky's in the cow barn. Maddie, the trees are beautiful from this cold snap. Put your school things away and go for a walk. Maybe sketch with the pencils your father sent. I wish dad had kept them at home for when I go back, but I don't say, okay. I get my coat on and take my sketch pad outside. Frost still whites the shaded creek coulee. I walk the main horse trail up mountain toward the lower salt lick. I want to sketch, but after everything that's happened, I've got to be specially careful about getting attached to things by drawing them or I'll get trapped. Magpies make a ruckus over something that's died, maybe a pack rat. And I watch camp robbers racketing from the Ponderosa. Things you wouldn't think are traps can get you. Normal things, eating food like, like, like venison and you're tricked. I read about that girl in the Tanglewood Tales by Nathaniel Hawthorne. He's a New Englander like me. She got kidnapped and taken to the underworld and got really hungry like anybody would and ate some pomegranates. She had to stay in hell for the amount she ate. But her mom finally came and saved her. I hope Montana food doesn't count against me. But I know my aunt and uncle are trying to be nice and make me feel okay, feel at home because of mom being sick, if that's really true. 
and I have to make sure it doesn't work. I have to get back home to see what's really happened. Besides, you never can tell. One minute they're nice, the next, bam, just like now with my uncle. Evening, the same day, another Montana chore, bringing in the cows for milking. It's 35 degrees now. I couldn't find my right gloves mate. I lose things right and left. I stick one hand in my parka. And I can't keep my mind on things either. My uncle's always saying, Maddie, you'd forget your head. The Australian Shepherd Susie and the Border Collie Pandora race ahead along the side hill to the pastures, west toward Thunder Mountain. Von Rees the cat trails me. Sunset blazes from the old forest fire smoke that still hangs in the air, sends almost horizontal bars of gold across at us. Our breath mist turns gold. Von Rees is white with black patches like a little Holstein cow. Maybe it's his tail stuck straight up that reminds me of Smudge, my cat I had in Connecticut. Just last November, when mom and dad and my brother were all together at home like normal, seems forever ago, I raced from school and whistled for Smudge to help me fill the hanging feeder in our backyard with sunflower seeds. My dad named Smudge for the big black one on his pink kitty nose. Dad made the feeder like a real bird restaurant with a cedar shingle roof, just like the old mill, where I always get to order lobster. I was counting birds for a science project. Dad said, Smudge is a marked cat, a known criminal like you, Skizix. My dad joked a lot, except when he didn't. But it was bad that Smudge killed birds when his criminal part showed. He'd been told not to, so I had to watch him. But my dad said, who will watch the watcher, hmm? I knew about the chickadee, the baby robin, and the indigo bunting, but not about the ones Smudge ate and didn't drag in to show us. I did get to do the burials on the ones I knew about. But that day after school, I couldn't find Smudge. I lost things, forgot things, right and left, but Smudge always came when I called. He had to be around because he'd followed my bike that morning on the way to school until he stopped at Nelson's house down Francis Lane like he always did. And he walked with his tail straight up like my brother's ham radio antenna. More pooch than pusser, dad said. Wouldn't be surprised to hear him bark. I stopped looking for smudge because mom told me to put my schoolwork right away. She said, I made molasses cookies, have your snack. She sat down next to me, tell me about school and I have something to tell you. So I forgot about Smudge to tell mom about my fifth grade advanced science that day, how we learned how animal babies survive and we saw how baby monkeys go crazy, like they have cooties when they're not held and we'll even think a chicken wire roll wrapped in a towel is their mom when their moms are taken away. They have to have this attachment, see, Mr. Dixtra said, and they keep that feeling all their lives after they've got it. It's like having a safe place inside so you can trust going out and doing things on your own. Humans need this too. Later in the same class, we learned how ducklings will follow the first thing they see after they're hatched, and that's their mom, no matter not a duck. Mr. Dixtra nearly choked laughing, telling us that the famous Mr. Conrad Lawrence was Mother Goose. It's imprinting, he said. I asked mom, does it ever stop working? And moms forget who's following, or it's an ugly duckling, or it doesn't stick, and a baby forgets the imprint, gets left behind. I was thinking about a book they gave me one Christmas about a baby turtle who was always late for everything, breakfast, school, dinner, playtime. One day he came home late from school and everybody was gone. They'd all moved away and the story ends. I had nightmares about that and mom had to come in because, well, I wet my bed again, which was really embarrassing. But I still got damn and got late. All of a sudden mom got up and left the kitchen. Maybe the phone rang and I didn't hear it, but when she came back, she was wiping her eyes. Just a little allergy, Skizix. She gave me a second molasses cookie and we sat there. 
I got to thinking about Smudge again and how he wasn't imprinted on me, but he always came when I called. And he must have been attached because he always went off and did things on his own, but came back. I got up to look out the kitchen window. Maybe Smudge was sitting under the feeder like he likes to do. Mom, have you seen Smudge? I need to do my feeder chore and he likes to help. She said, sit down a minute, Skeezix. I'll get you some cranberry juice. You like that. I said, Mom, have you seen? She said, Smudge has gone to kitty heaven. Well, I knew all about dying because of the birds, and my dad read me the Mask of the Red Death, but he's not sick. He followed again just this morning. Mr. Nelson is so sorry, Skeezix. Smudge was lying asleep on their driveway. Mr. Nelson looked, but he didn't see Smudge until he felt the bump. When I didn't say anything, Mom said, it's okay to feel bad, aren't you? Well, Mom must have been lying. I mean, it got me for a minute, but it couldn't have been true. I wasn't going to blub, and I'd say something practical and scientific. Dad always told me to do that so Mom wouldn't get upset. Dad always said, don't burden your mother. She gets sick easily. And when she does, you have to go visit strangers. And you told me you don't like that. So I said, can I bury Smudge next to the birds? He'll fit in the shoebox for my new sneakers. And he liked that box to jump in. Well, he's been buried already. Where? Didn't you have a service? I'm not sure. I felt mom was fibbing, but why? Anyway, people needed to know about Smudge, even if I couldn't have a funeral and make a cross and pick flowers. So I put my L.L. Bean windbreaker back on and went around and knocked on people's doors and rang if they had a bell and said, our cat died. Formal like, everybody who came to the door was sorry. Nobody was home at four places, but I did get a Baby Ruth, a Macintosh apple, which are the best kind, a Bonomo banana taffy, and 50 cents. And I didn't cry in front of people, except Mrs. Clark, just in between. I had to sit down a couple of times. It was that bad, but I just didn't cry in front of anybody. And you know how hard it is to keep from doing that? Well, I've learned it just doesn't get you anywhere. After I got back, I washed my face first, then asked, Mom, can we drive me, can you drive me to the Davises later? They weren't there. I told her how sorry people said they were. Oh, Skeezix. Mom sat down hard on a kitchen chair. She had a handkerchief in her left hand. She was making apple brown Betty nutmeg smell everywhere. She said, it's okay to not tell everybody. You don't have to go around. Some things are personal. That's like when your father got sick. Remember how after you told everyone and they all started bringing casseroles over and trying to clean the house and your father was furious? I thought how Mrs. Clark invited me in and I got to sit on her new blue velvet sofa and she gave me spice cider and she held me when I started crying. That was a useful time to cry. Mom held me too because I was sitting next to her in the kitchen and you could smell apples and cinnamon, but moms are supposed to do that. When it's a new person holds you, it feels special in your tummy, like when dad let me have a sip of his Sautern wine. I mean, Mrs. Clark didn't have to, like moms do, uh, like it's a mom's job. I snapped back to Montana. The dogs are going nuts, barking and digging. They found a groundhog. I realize I've stopped on the side hill and it's getting cold. Von Wies weaves around my ankles like cats do. Everything reminds me of something else and the way these sunbeams lie before afterglow reminds me of that summer evening. It was just two months ago. It was after my mom's birthday on the 5th of July, but I hadn't gotten a thank you from her for the card I sent and a present I made from a discarded horseshoe. We were all eating dinner after a day of haying, the first crop of alfalfa, and my aunt got up to answer the military surplus field telephone in our kitchen. It has a funny burble ring like underwater. The phone company won't put in a real phone this far out from Great Falls. It was that time of evening when the sun comes horizontal through the windows and can blind you. I could hear the horses' bells from the upland forest pasture lease they graze in the summer 
because all the doors were open to the screens. Everything went gold suddenly in the dining room just before it got cooler, like it does right after sundown this high in the mountains. No one was talking. We were all so tired from haying. You could hear chewing and silverware clink on plates, tiny bits of hay pricked under my collar. I think Susie and Pandora had just raced off up to the South Hayfield barking after something, maybe a mule deer coming down close or they sighted a coyote. Nobody was paying much attention to anything but eating. My aunt came back from the phone and stood in the kitchen door watching us, shading the right side of her face from the sun with a cupped hand. She said, Maddie's mother died. Some of the boys, the summer boys who paid to stay at the ranch for a month stopped eating, and some of them didn't. I just got up so fast I knocked my stool over, but I put my fork down right, crossways, pointing at 10 o'clock. It still had tuna surprise on it, like I hadn't had time to eat, special with potato chips on top. I didn't know what to do. Everybody was looking. So I headed downstairs, even though it wasn't my room in the summer. I had to sleep in an outer cabin with the summer boys, like I didn't belong to the house at all. I knew by then how to stop myself showing how I felt, so the bigger boys didn't have the satisfaction when they hit me, but I couldn't do it totally right. Still, I made it to the downstairs without blubbering. I lay across the guest bed and fisted my eyes and bit my inner cheek, but it started again. I knew it'd never stop. Then my aunt followed me down and leaned over me and I couldn't breathe. She tried to stroke my hair, which I hate, and I shook her off. Guess I'll have to be your mom now. Never, I said to myself. I just couldn't hold on then, but by late that evening when she drove me to Bergeron's in Monarch to call my dad, I'd stopped it. Stop thinking, except the part of me that can look at things like a cut and think facts about what to do. I don't remember what dad said on Mrs. Bergeron's crank up pay telephone, but I knew I should try to make him feel better. So I asked him if his leg hurt from where his wooden one attached. My aunt didn't cry either. I didn't go to mom's funeral. I wanted to, but I didn't say, and they didn't ask, and my aunt said I had to stay in school. So I don't have proof mom actually died like with the birds. My aunt put on her gabardine business suit and flew back east. My cousin and I stayed with my uncle. He's a really bad cook. About a month ago, actually just two weeks, dad wrote me a letter, but I'd gotten smart. All the summer boys were gone, but I still knew better than to open it where anybody could see me. And I was right, because Dad didn't say he was coming to get me. He described Mom's hospital room in Porchester, New York. He talked about Dr. Will Shusen and said my brother was sad and unhappy. He said he was flying to Tampa in a week for his work for American Can Company. But he ended with this. We sit by your mother. She murmurs, pretty. The tiger lilies your brother bought, brought from her garden. Lilium lanchifolium. She asks for a little water and the nurse has to set her up against the pillows. And even with all the morphine, she seems so hurt in such bad pain. Of course, I can't move her, what with my bad leg. And then I hold her hand and your brother is crying and doesn't want your mother to see. He turns away and stands at the window. The late sun streams gold. When he pulls down the shade from the blinding, it diffuses the light and the room turns gold. Every sunset hurts. She says your name and I kiss her goodbye for you. Here on a high desert side hill in Montana, it's gotten very cold. I don't think I'll ever get warm. Von Ries and I turn back toward the ranch. The cows pretty much come in by themselves when they know they've been found. They follow like they're imprinted. I wish I could tell Mr. Dijkstra. They're attached to the barn. Ha, 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 ha. But I'm alone here. So on the way back, I think what to do out loud because the dogs can keep secrets. How can I get down to Bergeron's store and call my dad without Mrs. Bergeron telling my aunt and uncle? I only have my aunt's word about my mom, and mom always said when I was little, never walk home alone, Skizix. Call your father, and I'll come get you. Thank you.
Thank you, Austin, for such a moving uh, reminiscence and piece of creative nonfiction and uh, once again immersing us into a younger person's point of view. Uh, we'll take a moment here to see uh, if we have uh, questions coming in. And uh, while we do that, we'll uh, also want to put out uh, a special reminder that there is the Lane Writers. Uh, I want to want to say <laughs> the Lane Writers Network uh, org uh, website where you can find out um, not only about the Lane Literary Guild and its events, but also various literary events throughout our county. And uh, there are a number of them going on through through Zoom. And we're just really very happy to have this and, and to thank uh, Sherry Wellburn for having done that. Um, also, we want to also remind you that we have in town our literary bookstore, Tsunami Books, and you can give them a call um, if you want to investigate uh, work such uh, such as uh, the writers present here, and uh, also to, to to give them some support. They also have a website, and it's very very fortunate that we have a small literary bookstore here in this community because, as you know, they're a vanishing breed throughout throughout our country. So um, anyway, uh, we are now going to look at some questions, um, if any have come in from the outside. If not, I'm, I'm going to get us launched with a question or two. Uh, Wendy, did you have anything come in yet? Or? I haven't got, had anything come in via email, which is okay. unusual, but. All right, well, let's, let's start with Shirley then. Um, Shirley, uh, again, thank you for your vivid reading. And I, I'm just curious about how you access your imagination for uh, a, a distant historical moment. Um, do you do quite a lot of research or do you draw on your experience or what 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 uh, resources do you use? Well, a little of both. You know, the book is a little bit of a love letter to the place I grew up, the, the San Francisco Peninsula. So I can oh. see some places. So another writer asked me one time, you know, how is it that I write the, um, the descriptions? And I said, well, I just watched the movie. So I think it's, you know, imagining, uh, and I, and that's what I love about historical fiction is that it's like time travel for me. I just get to go back and just be in it and see it. Good. Yeah. Very great. Wonderful. And uh, uh, Austin, um, this is a large, this is a kind of more of a, a broad question, but do you, you feel that there's quite a bit of contrast in your ongoing book between uh, the experiences in, in New York and in Montana. Is that, that central to kind of some of the things that you're exploring? Yes, very much so. Um, Could you elaborate on that? Yes, I can. Um, the narrator in this book was initially raised in an, a highly literary environment and very arts oriented and at the same time very science oriented um the mother taught botany at vassar for a decade or so before she got married the father was essentially autodidact um but very very smart um and as is my brother and my brother is a smart one of the family and, uh, um and so it was a radical departure from a relatively warm parental environment to a very cool and uh, older and highly intellectual and quite um, practical environment. If, if, any, if I have any ounce of practicality in me, it certainly came from the environment in Montana uh, where you just basically fix things. And the other thing is there's always fence to fix. I mean, there's always something and so you just best keep busy because if you don't the cows will find a way through and then they will start eating the spruce and then the milk will taste terrible <laughs> so, so it's a very radically different environment and also economically I mean, it's a very economically depressed area but that my aunts and uncle had enough money to live on so 
and that background of my uncles, of the narrator's uncle, was uh, profoundly influenced in that I don't think my uncle ever dropped the rich boy persona, which lurked underneath Gabby Hayes. So. But they were kind. They took me in. Otherwise, I would have been in an orphanage. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, Shirley, you, you shift points of view in your reading, which is really interesting. And is are there a variety of points of view in your novel, or is there just uh, the two that you represented in the first chapter? And yeah. It's mostly just Mariana and Patrick. And uh, I, I decided to have Patrick as a point of view character because I wanted to have the story go to the actual war, to the events that happened uh, with the takeover of California. And it, I really couldn't imagine how Mariana could be there. Um, she could certainly be impacted by it, but I wanted an eyewitness to the Bear Flag Revolt, for example. Um, so it made sense to have Patrick's point of view. And, and um, you know, this, so it's, yeah. Uh, and there is a small piece where her father, we get her father's point of view as well, just to um, get deeper into the history, uh, to, to have somebody else be present during an historic moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I thought that yeah, you did well in, in conveying like there was two kind of two different worlds there, you know, uh, just in terms of the sensibility of the two points of view that, that you that you developed. So, OK, that's great. Um, yeah. Uh, and and Austin, um, you know, it's, of course, very moving to to hear how such a, a, a young person deals with grief and, and kind of the roundabout manner that, that truly I think young people, at least if I'm drawing on my own experience, deal with it. And I was just wondering how you plummeted yourself into a, a, a younger self like that. Uh, what, 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 what were some of the steps you took? Well, I think as was mentioned about the movie, um, I've always seen theatrical scenes and when I was when I was younger I used to regularly make up scenes I'd make little boxes little stages with scenery in them um, I suppose I was inspired by what in more elegant company would be called Fabergé eggs but I just made little 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 boxes and put scenes in them and I could manipulate that theater and so my um and my imaginative process tends to go there. Plus, much of my training was in performance and theater. So I also um, speak lines and have dialogues in my head. And occasionally those sneak out into public and people ask me if I'm off my medication, but generally <laughs> not. <laughs> Uh, I think it's especially moving to to bring that younger sensibility in and then see that sensibility is thrust into a foreign world um, of Montana, which is harder and more masculine in the stereotypical sense um, as as distinct from the, the the softer world that the mother brought in and her sensibility. so. I think all of that works definitely in coordination in a really nice way. Um, so, and, and surely I, I was also interested in a similar way to, to how you plummeted yourself into a younger, younger point of view, uh, especially since the historical context is different as well. Gosh, I don't really, you know, I hadn't, I haven't thought about that, but um, I think I, and I, you know, and I was concerned that I wasn't, that I was not writing a young adult novel. So I, I, I always thought of her as having an adult sensibility, but of course she couldn't. And it just, it, in, in an effort to be real, I had to make her truly, you know, young and, and, 
um, just innocent or naive or whatever she is uh, to to make the story work. So I guess just just imagining, you know, what uh, how a, a teenager with so little life experience would respond to authority and um, fear and other things that she has to live through. And uh, are, are we to take it as something of a kind of a the driving mystery of the book as to why she wishes to liberate herself, which comes out in that that first chapter, or uh, what um, it is for the for the first part, and then it switches to her her what her what she wants her um, search for independence in that very cloistered culture switches to actually uh, wanting to save that cloistered culture um, uh, uh, um, because it's about to be overrun by the forces of manifest destiny. Sure. Oh, that's great. Um, and then, and, and then in a parallel manner, Austin, do you feel that, that in, in this larger manuscript that you're working with, uh, it is, is grief the, the primary, driving force, would you say, uh, grief as perceived by this younger sensibility, or um, how would you say that, see that, just to give us kind of a, a bit of a view of what might be coming in the future? Well, not only is disenfranchised grief uh, apparent here, that is that you just basically go on, which disenfranchises any sort of feelings, which is a strategy. I mean, I've known many people who have done that strategy and they seem to do fine. This particular narrator didn't. And so there's this uh, constant movement through the manuscript, which is rather like one of those paddle balls, you know, the paddle where you had the elastic and the ball. It's like this independence of so the person would move out on this elastic and then suddenly slam back. Mm -hmm. And so the subsequent major relationship that then comes the latter part of the of the piece uh, was fraught with those themes of disattachment, uh, of obsession, and um, boundary crossing, and all sorts of those kinds of very unhappy events. Um, and so grief is part of that, certainly. But it's also, I think, too, about how some kind of intrinsic capacity begins to come out and how one begins to live through these things, perhaps even age out of them. Very good. Well, I, I'm just, you know, so impressed tonight by how both of you have conveyed uh, so with such sympathy and compassion, these younger points of view and, and, and created a world so that we can actually uh, live in it, live in their it, live in their shoes, and in a in a really particular way. Uh, Wendy, do you have anything else you'd like to add? We're kind of coming to the end of our questions, but do you have anything? Yeah, I I don't except to say thank you. First of all, thank you, Austin and Shirley, for reading your your beautiful work. Um, very moving and just fantastic. So I'm so glad you were both able to join us. Um, thank you, Henry, for all you do as ever. Um, I'm looking forward to our next Wimfall reading series, which will be not December. We're taking December off, to understand it, but we're looking forward to January. And we will make sure to let everybody know what's on the um, menu then for our next reading. Um, and this has just been fantastic. So thank you all so much for coming and for reading and participating. It's just been a real joy. I'd like to just add uh, kind of as a as a preview um, that in January, January 19th, and by the way, I just want to remind everybody, uh, starting in January all the way through till May, uh, we'll be meeting every third Tuesday at 6 p.m., just exactly this way through StreamYard. So you could actually put that on your calendars. And the next two people that will be reading will be Diane Dugas, who'll be reading her prose, and um, and Amanda Powell, who'll be reading her poetry. Um, they are wife and wife, and um, makes such a, an interesting um, vision, create such an 
interesting vision, each of them. So I encourage you all to do that. And I want to, again, thank Wendy for, for wonderful choreography <laughs> tonight and, and being such a gracious hostess to us. So oh, thank, thank you. you. I enjoyed this and I look forward to January. Diane Dugas was one of my professors at the U of O and I oh. enjoyed her classes a great deal. So I'm very- Wonderful, wonderful. So um, yeah, so this will be fantastic. And I will see you in January, most certainly, and hopefully through May and beyond and someday in person. But yeah, then, absolutely. <laughs> we'll all meet there. Right. Thanks well, thank again. You. Thanks. Yeah. Again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Thank you, Hank. Thank you, Wendy. Thank yeah. you. Beautiful reading, Austin. Oh, you too, Shirley. Thank you so much. It was very moving.